Yes, we have a, this challenging subject, as, as you know, uh, G2 organization is launching this campaign of 100 million tons by 2030. You all have already uh, imagined um, the, the fact sheet, which explain a little bit uh, how it's going to get this 100, 100 million tons. But right now we have an amazing uh, distinguished group of panelists that definitely we we are going to go through is um, trying to sort this. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Just to introduce, um, we have uh, Vinette Mitchell, the chairman of Abada Group. Vinette, welcome. Good morning. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, uh, Andy March, CEO of Black Power. Hi, Andy. Hi. How are you doing? Paddy Padmanchan, President and CEO of Aqua Power. Thank you. Good morning. And Andy March, CEO of, sorry, Alex, <laughs> sorry, Alex Hewitt, CEO of CWP Global. Hi. Hi. Hi, really nice to meet you. So um, we have a little bit, um, I think we have running out of time uh, because it was, it took longer the previous session. So uh, I will give you five minutes to introduce each other, your companies, what you are doing, and then we will have a Q&A session, okay? Oh, so let's start with you, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vineet Mittal. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur uh, uh, who started the journey from .com. And uh, this is my second venture uh, is uh, Avada Energy, uh, where uh, we are uh, building uh, large grid connected uh, solar and wind uh, hybrid farms, uh, solar farms. And uh, last year, we entered into the space of uh, green hydrogen, green ammonia. And uh, recently, we have signed uh, a half million ton uh, uh, supply contract uh, for export market from India. Uh, uh, what we have uh, seen in our journey when I started uh, way back in 2009 in green energy, uh, that when we used to talk about we will do 500 megawatt in five years, people used to laugh. And uh, uh, even the suppliers, when I reached out to First Solar to buy 15 megawatt uh, solar panels, uh, they decided not to sell it to us unless we find an EPC contractor from Europe. And uh, from those days, uh, when we bought uh, modules from um, a dollar and a half uh, per watt peak uh, to currently when we are buying at 20 to 22 cents uh, per watt peak, uh, the life has changed. Uh, and uh, and uh, what we have seen is that uh, whatever human minds can uh, uh, think of or believe in, uh, probably the universe conspires to make it happen. And uh, when we were discussing uh, uh, today with uh, Paddy, I think uh, he kind of inspired me to share a story, uh, which I share it with my team member. So it's uh, very relevant to the today's topic. Uh, and uh, the story goes uh, something uh, from the village of India where a farmer's son, he, were, uh, he read about elephants and uh, animals in the classroom. And he uh, asked his father, why don't you take me to the city and uh, let me uh, visit the zoo and see the animals. And father says he doesn't make enough to take him there, but he promises he will save and take him there. And uh, as luck would have it, uh, the village had a circus. Uh, circus is where animals perform and these are this is an old story so that time animal rights was not there and uh, so uh, when the circus comes to their village father was so excited he comes back home and saying son we are going in the morning uh, to see the circus and they reach the circus at 10 o'clock where the show starts at noon and uh, both father and son uh, gets the permission to see where the animals are kept so he sees a uh, lion he's so happy and so glad that he got to see the lion he sees uh, bears he sees uh, other animals and then suddenly he notices a very big elephant and he's so excited to see such a big uh, magnificent uh, animal and uh, and suddenly he, he starts looking at his father and says father father uh, i look at uh, this big elephant and i look at the chain which is tying his leg and it's such a small chain. Why such a big elephant is not able to break this small chain? And father says, a very smart question, son. I wish I had the answer. Let's go to the ringmaster and ask him. 
and uh, when they go to the ringmaster, he says that your son is very observant. He is going to do very well. When the elephant came, he was a baby elephant, and his owner gave it uh, the, the small uh, baby elephant to us. And that time, this chain was big enough to tie him down. And he tried it many times, and he could not break. And now his mind believes that uh, he cannot uh, break the chain. And that's actually the thing which uh, is very relevant for us today. We all are talking about how to make a uh, hundred uh, million ton happen. It's in our mind. If we care about our society, if we care about our kids, if we care about our own future, then we will make it happen. It's in us. I think the technology exists. Some bit of regulatory framework already exists. What we need to do in all our personal capacity, believe in this, that uh, what we got from our ancestor, we have no right to abuse that environment. And if we can't do good for others, we can't do bad either. So if we have to meet these targets of 1.5 degrees and others, then it is very important we start believing in that hydrogen is doable and 100 million ton is just a stepping stone and we all collectively will make it happen. Thank you. Wow, Vinet, thank you very much for that story. Andy? I'm going to stand because I lights in my eyes. So first, uh, I'm the CEO of Plug, been doing this for 14 years. And I'm going to start out by saying, uh, Andrew was talking about courage, but Plug has a lot of courage already. We built the first commercial market for fuel cells, not the sexiest market in the world, putting in forklift trucks, but there's over 55,000 of them running at the moment, using about 50 tons of hydrogen a day. And when you look at it, 25% uh, of the US food moved through our products during COVID. Then when I take a step back, Plugs built 185 fueling stations. Nobody knows that. Those fueling stations every two seconds, even as we're standing here now, are being used. No one else in the world is doing that. We're building the first green hydrogen network across the United States. I actually don't think about tons per year. I actually think about tons per day. Now we're building 500 tons per day by 2025, all green. We're building plants today. We'll have online by the end of this year, 70 tons a day. I have to multiply that by 365 to see where it is. But we have real customers for this activity. Amazon, Walmart, and we're around the world. Uh, yesterday, we announced uh, with H2 Energy, a one gigawatt project in Denmark, which will be powering trucks from Hyundai, uh, other applications. We're doing it today. Uh, if you look in Australia, we're working with Fortescue to build a factory. With SK, we have a joint venture uh, to produce stationary power, 400 megawatts by 2025 in South Korea. And in France, we have a JV with Renault, where together we're putting vehicles on the road and expect to have 250,000 green hydrogen vehicles on the road at that time. And we're hoping a lot of that green hydrogen will come from our partnership here and JV with Axiona in Spain. So. Uh, I know there's a lot of talk about what it can be. I'm really interested because I'm getting old, what it is today, and we're trying to make it all happen today. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. Paddy? Thank you. Uh, delighted to be here this morning with you. Paddy Padmanathan, I'm uh, Vice Chair and CEO of Aquapower. We're a company that was founded uh, six, 17 years ago, uh, focused initially at reliably uh, producing re uh, energy, first uh, electricity and desalinated water um, at the lowest possible price. Um, so that was our mission from day one. We've grown fairly fast. Uh, so today we operate in 16 countries. Uh, we have a contracted capacity of uh, 41 gigawatts uh, of electricity. And we're the largest desalinator in the world, 6 million cubic meters per day of desalinated water. Uh, in 2010, uh, we started out fossil fuel uh, out of Saudi Arabia uh, to fuel the 
plants for electricity production. But in 2010 itself, uh, we convinced ourselves that um, renewable energy was the future and started to get involved very significantly in renewable energy. And we have grown in renewable energy very fast. From day one, even with the fossil fuel, we started out with a philosophy of not market pricing what we do, uh, rigorously focus on minimizing cost, price the risks correctly, no contingencies, understand the risks and manage the risks and minimize, absolutely deliver the lowest possible cost. When we started to do that, it was pretty stunning at how quickly we were able to drive the delivered cost down. So no surprise when we got into renewable energy, we never bid a single feed-in tariff project. We refused to participate in feed-in tariff programs. We said that that was just artificially keeping prices high. Um, we went out for competitive tenders. And on those competitive tenders, we were able to drive costs spectacularly fast. So we ended up with, and we still hold uh, the records for the lowest wind tariff, the lowest PV tariff, the lowest CSP tariff, whatever. Um, fairly large plants, and we've grown in renewable energy very fast. A few years ago, we realized that, look, we have now in some of the markets that we operate um, across the equator, um, fantastic solar and wind resources. Solar and wind could be coupled, buffered with a little bit of battery, even though battery was expensive, and that we could potentially deliver at a few cents per kilowatt hour renewable, reliable renewable energy for fairly long durations. And we got, got interested in understanding uh, hydrogen uh, electrolysis process and convinced ourselves that, look, this can be done. Uh, this can be made cost competitive. And um, two and a half years ago, started working earnestly on uh, pulling together a first project, which, so we are now involved in uh, producing hydrogen too. In that we have gone forward with the first, I think it's ended up being the first at scale green hydrogen uh, facility that's in construction. So we've already gone into construction on a facility that will produce so sticking with your theme, uh, I was going to say just under a quarter of a million tons a year, but it's actually so therefore 650 tons per day of uh, green hydrogen. Um, this facility in the northern end of Saudi Arabia is being powered by 4.3 gigawatt, 4.4 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy, uh, solar and wind, roughly half and half, uh, two gigawatts of electrolyzers, um, and it will, will produce a hydrogen converted to liquid ammonia. And at this point, that's the best vector to take it out uh, and ship it um, possibly to Europe initially to the Far East. So that seven and a half billion dollar plus or minus project has already gone into construction. Uh, we have gone forward with construction with equity from the three partners, Aquapower, Air Products and Neom are the three equal partners uh, investing in the project. Uh, so with our equity, we have gone forward and we have fairly close to uh, closing the financing on all the debt as well. So we'll be in full construction and we have publicly stated that we expect to be dispatching uh, green ammonia, 1.2 million tons by first quarter 2026, okay? So that's what we are doing and uh, today. And what I, what I know, uh, having seen my colleagues and having been personally involved in um, in this project and bringing this project to this particular point, 100 million can be done. This is not an issue. But it can be done only if we all just get on with doing it. And I, you know, okay, I don't know whether the chicken came or the egg came first. I have no idea and I don't need to know. Um, I, this nonsense about sitting and waiting for the market. I'm sorry, the market is there. It's 100 million tons that's being used today, gray hydrogen. So why is it that we want to invent a new market? And there is a hell of a lot more to come. This is not the issue. So the issue is there is no green hydrogen to replace that gray hydrogen today. That's why it's still being used. Are you, can anybody in this room really believe that if we are able to deliver a million tons of green hydrogen today at whatever price, that somebody is not gonna buy it today? I don't think so. We have utterly convinced. So I think here we have an opportunity because the world is completely aligned with us where you build it and they will come. 
but just make sure that you build it with real rigorous focus on cost so that you absolutely minimize that cost so that you are sitting with something. You're not producing $100 a kilo hydrogen. You, you will be very surprised at what prices hydrogen can be produced today. Fertilizer, ammonia. So look, I, I don't think anybody should be dreaming that we're gonna go back to $300 and $400 a ton of ammonia. This is finished. It's a different world. Okay, maybe it might not be the $1,400 or $1,200 of today. I don't know what the market price today is. But we can do hydrogen, ammonia today below 600. We should be able to get on with it. So, and day after tomorrow, easy. That can be exactly like in renewable energy, that will come down to 400, even in today's inflationary market, rising interest rates and supply chain shortages. The good news is if whoever is getting on with projects today who have signed MOUs, if they really pedal hard, it's unlikely that they will be able to go into construction for another 18 months. During that 18 months, the supply chain issues should start to get, it's not gonna get solved, but it should start to ease up. Costs should start to kind of even out. So I think we're in the right place. We just need to get on with doing it and it can be done. Thank you very much, Pali. Alex? Yeah, thank you very much. And I guess it's a, it's a real honor to be in this evangelical hall of, <laughs> of green hydrogen. And, and, I've, and, and uh, a couple of the themes have been urgency, scale, and courage. And, and, and it's great to, to follow courageous entrepreneurs, like my colleagues here, and Lei Zhang and Andrew. Um, and I like to think that we're pretty courageous as well. We've uh, always, uh, always seen big and been audacious and started some pretty big projects. But uh, and in short, very briefly, CWP, big renewable developer, we did the largest wind farm in Europe back in 2008 in Romania of all places. We went on to build the largest renewable platform in Australia. And then in 2017, well, actually, we've been looking at a big site, 2015, we switched to hydrogen to do a crazy 25 gigawatt project. And believe me, we were, we were seen as crazies. We were loonies back then, and the world's come a long way. Um, agree with Patty entirely. The demand's there. We don't have to wait for that. I have all faith in Lei Zhang and Andy. They're gonna build electrolyzers as fast as anyone has seen. Uh, but. And I feel like I really got to get behind this yes, we can theme here. But at the same time, I just kind of want to throw out a few sobering facts. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at Lord Adair Turner, who put up some great numbers yesterday about the scale. And it's hard to it's hard to understand what you know thousands of terawatt hours are. Or what is the topic here? Is 100 million tons of hydrogen by 2030. I have no doubt, by the way, in the 2030s, we'll get there. But 2030, um, so let's just sort of, I, I don't know, does anyone know what 100 million tons of hydrogen looks like? I don't even know what a ton of hydrogen looks like. You guys probably, <laughs> Andy, you probably have an idea. But we're we're generators basically so we kind of back out into the challenge of building that amount of renewable energy generation because that's green hydrogen it's renewable it's wind it's solar it's hydro and a hundred million tons of hydrogen is 1400 gigawatts so i don't know whether anyone can envision what a hundred 1400 gigawatts is but it's about 5,000 terawatt hours, what's that? That's about one and a half times the entire generation of Europe. So today, what is being done in Europe, in fossil fuels, in renewables, in nukes, is about 3,000 terawatt hours, it's a bit under that. So in order to make 100 million tons of hydrogen, you have to build out an equivalent generation of one and a half times all of Europe. So I don't mean to be negative, but it, look, it's a sobering number. And I think the other interesting thing is when we look at the overall 
uh, announcement of hydrogen projects. And there's hundreds and hundreds of them, it's great. But the Pareto principle of, uh, applies here. If you sort of go through that list, about 86% of them are all over two gigawatts. It's hard finding sites for two gigawatts, let alone five, 10, 20, 30, 100 gigawatts. It's, it's a challenge. So I think what we'll see in terms of the generation, which I'm talking about, is that 80% uh, will come from very renewable energy rich areas which are remote from the load. For example, where Paddy's doing his project down in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, where we're doing projects in North Africa and Australia, et cetera. So then there's got to be infrastructure that joins it all up. Most of this infrastructure has lead times of 10 years. Can it be done quicker? Lei Zhang's gone, but he would say yes. And certainly in China, they can do that very fast, but it's a challenge. Our project, uh, again, sobering fact, 25 gigawatts it, in a single project, that's $35 billion. No problem with the money. I'm sure that'll flow. But it, it's, it's actually the lead time. It, 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 you're looking at uh, about six years of development. And once again, Patty, you'll probably say you can do it a bit quicker, but it, it's, you know, on average, that's what you're looking at. A wind farm will just, it will take almost that. So then you've got four years of, of construction. So it's kind of 10 years. There's, there's, a, there's a lead time involved there. So 35 billion, 10 years, and that project will produce 2 million tonnes of hydrogen. We need 50 of those by 2030. So again, it, it, this is the challenge, I think, and it's an immense challenge, but look, yes, we can, we, we can, we can do this. <laughs> and, I, and I think what, I, and we can't do it alone. You know, we need 10 Fortescues and we need Envisions, but another 10 or 20 of them and plug powers and, and aquas. We, we, we need more, join the race, become our partner, become their partners, throw everything at it. And I think like Andrew Forrest said, ignore the politics, that'll work itself out. It's changing already. I'm counting down the days to an Australian election in about five days time. <laughs> and I think there will be a change and politics will catch up. We've got to plow on, bulldozer through. And keep in mind, long lead times means you start now. Start now and go fast. So sorry, just to jump in on you, Alex. So you said it's 50, 50 projects of your scale. Okay, it's only 50, huh? not 5,000. 5, 50, there are only 50 other people required. Who's volunteering? No, seriously, it's not, yeah. I mean, look, well, if you really break it down, it is not. Yes, we are not going to have 100 million in the cars or in the factories by 2030. There's nothing to stop even if we start today or even next year, that that scale is not already part of it, not operational, and maybe a lot of it in advanced stage of construction by then even. Look, exactly like what happened in renewable energy, and we have, most of us have seen it because it's happened just now. Started slow, 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 then it just ramps up very fast. I, I, okay, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm following on from the stories. Look, I don't know how, I'm sure all of you at different times watch uh, Nature Stories and you've seen the wildebeest migration. Okay, so, there's the river, they're all standing on the side, hundreds of thousands of them. And as I don't know how many hundred thousand crocs are there and the wildebeest know that. They're gonna die on the side if they don't go to that side. Exactly like where we are, by the way. I mean, okay, we're lucky we'll probably die before, but uh, our grandchildren will die fast if we don't uh, get, no, seriously, this is an issue. And yet what happened? Have you seen what, what happens? They all stand there trying to whip up the courage and nobody can come up until one and then a few. And I, the point I'm trying to tell you here is that, and by the way, the good news is, have you seen, I have, I've seen these programs, maybe the same program, but I don't think so. I think different ones. I've never seen those few who jump in first and cross ever get killed. I have, of course, seen amongst the masses, a few get killed. But so it just requires that courage and conviction and they're there. That's all that's required, really, really, because all of us have got 
the ability. All of us are here in this room because we're all capable. And we've all got, I mean, entrepreneurs, you know, many of them, lots of money around. Money is not a shortage. So it's just the conviction and just get on with it and it will happen. Thank you. This is really inspiring, I think, <laughs> definitely. And, um, and you mentioned that the politics will catch up. Um, can you give us some examples on some recommendations? So, so in, on, Sorry, the question. Yes, it's, the question is, um, and no, I, I mean, um, the question is about how do you think uh, or how can polit politics can uh, help us to accelerate this? I mean, the political yeah. will right. catch up so, at some point. So you may have guessed I'm an American. So I kind of will give you an American view of the world. And I'm going to stand again because of the lights. And you know, first off, you know, what this I'm a real capitalist at heart too. And I believe the free markets actually make the best capital decisions most of the time. Where they don't do well is when you're confronted with externalities like carbon, right? It's hard for the market to price. What the government does horrible, in my opinion, is actually decide what projects should do. So what I found that works is actually you see in the solar and wind industry. You know, why did it grow in the US? It grew in the US because of something called the investment tax credit, which provided a 30% reduction for the project. And the investors got their money back in five years. It really drove solar and wind in the state. And probably in many ways, it's kind of very much like the contract for differences in Europe. So having the government help drive down the cost of the investment with items like the investment tax credit help a great deal. So in the US at the moment, I know that uh, if you don't live there, it looks chaotic. Uh, you agree? <laughs> so if you look at the, you know, I spent uh, last week, I was in DC, I spent 45 minutes with Joe Manchin. Some of you may not know who he is. He kind of controls what's going on as far as what's going to pass. Spent a lot of time with Louisiana, spent a lot of time with New Mexico, fossil fuel states. They're all huge supporters of hydrogen because they see it as their exit from oil and or their exit from fossil fuels. And when, when you look at policies that they're looking to put in place, is to put policies in place that provides an investment production tax credit of $3 per kilogram for the next 10 years. So if you build a plant today, investors know they'll get their money back in five years. It'll help companies like Plug drive down their costs. Because I've been, I saw these curves yesterday. I've been on a 25% learning curve for years. And if I look at the plant, we're building equipment's about 60% of it. It's all about as you mentioned, renewables. But that's how the government can help. By giving the incentives, it allows us to compete and make fertilizer, steel manufacturing actually economical. Gives us time to drive down our costs and we can be like the solar and wind industry. And that to me is really kind of the framework of how governments can support. I actually think they should be out of the business of actually deciding what projects are good and what projects are bad. I think they should be in the business of letting the market decide what projects are good and bad and providing a vision, a high level vision of what's possible. So that's how I think governments can help. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, Alex, have you got a view on the, what would be a good public policy to encourage the, the achievement of these 100 million tons? Well, your government's doing a pretty good job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, you know, the, I, I guess uh, the, the dream is a sort of a globalization of politics and a, a, and a master carbon price, which is going to cover the world and drive everything. And already carbon pricing is driving, you know, there's a sort of discussion about uh, green steel between Lei Zhang and, and Andrew. I mean, we were looking at green steel four years ago, and I remember colleagues coming up talking about green steel. I said, no, no. 10, 15 years away, 
well, it's, it's on the doorstep, it's, it's there. We're now looking at our projects, for example, in areas like the Pilbara and Mauritania where, um, where you've got iron ore and it's a no brainer. The cheapest way to export energy is through DRI, which is a, is a green iron ore. Um, I'm so, I've strayed from your question already, haven't I? Um, politics, yeah, global politics, carbon pricing. <laughs> I don't know, I can check, I, we could point to a lot of governments and say that's not what to do. Uh, I agree with Andy, it, it, it's vision, it's policy, maybe some little, uh, some contract for differences feed in tariffs can help kick it off, but ultimately it's not sustainable. We saw this in renewables. It, it worked for a few years and then boom, the global financial crisis came and it was just killed right across the world. And we went into a massive stall and the entire world lost 10 years, 2010 to 2020 we, is a lost decade. And I think most people in this room probably tried hard. We, we were struggling as a renewable energy developer and we, 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 we're booming now, but um, when you read the history books in 10 years, you know, there was momentum there at Kyoto towards perhaps some globalized carbon pricing and a, and a real drive forward. But unfortunately that didn't happen. And now it's sort of clawing its way back and, it's on a trajectory, but the sooner, the sooner we can have solid carbon pricing and markets there, that's going to help in immensely because that will end up with a market-driven economy. Okay, thank you. I would like to open the floor for any questions, so please, uh, I don't know. Oh, okay, are there? I think you have the mic over there. You have to, yes, yeah, yeah. You're going to walk. <laughs> Uh, I think Alex, you know, raised some questions about the supply side, but, but as I've said yesterday, I sort of do feel that supply side of 100 million tonnes could be overcome, and I'm more worried about the demand side when we add it up, and I find it difficult to see us getting to 100 million tonnes unless a big part of that comes from existing uses of hydrogen. Um, because it will just take time for steel or shipping. It just takes time for the capital stock turnover to occur. So my question is, how fast can we go? And what are the instruments to address the 30 million tons, which is already going into ammonia in a gray fashion? How fast can we get that over to green? Uh, and I guess the other big one is actually uh, hydrogen in the um, refining system in the oil refining system is a big uh, hydrogen user and Aaron Sharma talked yesterday about this forthcoming Indian uh, hy green hydrogen mandate to drive demand in some of these sectors can you comment on how fast and what policy levers we can address not new uses of hydrogen but the uses of hydrogen which are there already who uh, want to address uh, the question uh, guess, should I take you yeah uh, yeah, hello. I think what uh, India is doing is uh, is a very robust policy intervention. Uh, they are uh, creating uh, the whole marketplace uh, by mandating on uh, polluting industries uh, and uh, where it's a substitute. Uh, it's not like a new demand. So we are uh, one of the biggest uh, consumer of uh, ammonia, almost 50 million tons. Uh, and uh, the intent of the government is uh, to uh, move at least 25% uh, to start with uh, and then move on to 100% by 2035. Uh, they are starting with the railways. Uh, uh, they are looking at doing few pilots with the railways where they want to move their uh, electrical uh, and uh, diesel locomotives, all of them to uh, green hydrogen. Uh, they are looking at coming out with a policy uh, for the transport of uh, heavy uh, trucking industries. And fourth, uh, what they have done is uh, around 15% uh, uh, to start with in the refining area. That's what uh, industry wanted, uh, around 25%. They, there is a debate is still going on. So what they are doing is uh, uh, they are coming with uh, these policy and there is already a debate around uh, that new, no new steel capacity should come uh, without uh, having a component of green uh, green side. And on top of that, what India has done is very unique, uh, is that uh, there are big challenges around land acquisition, transmission, uh, and permitting. So when uh, even the solar uh, 
like alex was saying that uh, it's a last decade for india it was not a last decade we did uh, 100 gigawatt of uh, green energy installation because uh, government uh, uh, set up large uh, solar parks means uh, they provided you the evacuation and land at your doorstep so setting up uh, solar or wind farms became relatively easier and they did the power purchase agreements which were bankable and uh, were validated by multilateral institutes like ifc and similar thing they are trying to do in the uh, green hydrogen green ammonia space where they are saying you set up your uh, pro project anywhere and we will provide you the transmission to your plant uh, for free so there won't be any transmission losses and transmission costs for the projects which come uh, by 2025 so these are uh, some of a very good in, uh, intervention and on top of that what they did is in front of our prime minister they called up uh, the bankers they said you commit how many gigawatt of solar uh, you would fund you, uh, you call up a transmission guy how many gigawatt of transmission line you will build uh, you call up the provincial government or the utility saying how many gigawatt of uh, uh, powers you will purchase so he kind of uh, our government uh, kind of created the whole ecosystem on demand side supply side and ensured that you are uh, set for success and similar program we are seeing on the green hydrogen green ammonia side that for local market uh, they are going to leave no stone unturned because they want to become uh, independent of their gas import which is almost 60 percent of our gas we import today thank you um Pali, would, would you like to yeah look i think the, the easiest well? is uh, ammonia because uh, as we have already discovered it's the it, that's the best vector to uh, transport the hydrogen so one of the issues with hydrogen is obviously how to get it from the most optimum places of production to uh, the current locations of demand okay i think over time and time is the issue there um, just like the steel industry grew in uh, germany for a very good reason because that's where the coal was uh, we will end up uh, and qu quite rightly so a certain amount of industrial capacity uh, shifting to locations where hydrogen can be uh, most optimally we produce. So the idea of hydrogen uh, clusters, uh, industrial clusters around hydrogen, th th that will happen, no question. Um, you know, we're all very good at uh, sort of maximizing profit and optimizing things. So, so that's what will happen. But in the meantime, uh, ammonia uh, can be shipped around. Um, and so it goes into fertilizer. And, um, and today, uh, at the, it's already cost competitive. Uh, uh, green ammonia simply because of and the energy prices will remain where there is for some time to come and so we can use this period uh, to catch up so there is about 30 million tons that's ripe for conversion uh, straight away and I, I believe that that's what um, many should start targeting if they're not starting to target um, but then beyond that uh, what I can also see because we're all working at it um, pipelines I, I think, uh, you know, there is a pipeline network. Um, uh, SNAM, under Marco's leadership uh, before, had already started to experiment with how far they can stretch the existing pipeline network without major re-engineering. And I think they have shown that we can. Um, sort of quite a, quite a bit of the modern pipeline network can be adapted fairly straightforward. And so the link pipelines need to be put in uh, that will move uh, from... So, I mean, you know, from countries like Northern Africa to get across into Europe, is not that much of a challenge. And they are not gonna take decades to develop those projects because the good news is some of that pipeline is under sea, so nobody's gonna object to it. So, so I think it is, these are the levers that needs to happen and government, governments need to create that enabling environment. And, you know, what is it that we need? It's, uh, you know, TLC, you know, uh, not tender love and care, <laughs> but transparency, longevity, uh, certainty in policy that's what these are long-term massive investments with a recovery period of 30 40 years right so we need that sort of longevity and policy certainty um and 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 the policy uh, policy signals starting to come but it's way way too still too slow thank you Barry. um andy would you like to address a little bit the the question from other I guess um, I would uh, say that I guess I'm not as worried about demand and I'm probably not as worried about it being 100 million tons in 2030. I think it needs to be a lot. And you know, my number is 85 million tons of 
hydrogen you can sell today. So when I step back and say, what are the barriers? Uh, I think Alex here talked about the availability of renewables. That's a big challenge, right? I mean, those are big numbers. That's a challenge, uh, but there'll be more renewables built. What he didn't mention was if you had those renewables, would you rather sell electricity or make hydrogen? Making electricity, put it on the grid at the price of day, it might be a better short-term economic decision for a company. So I worry about that. I think a lot about pipelines, Patty. And when I think about pipelines, I think about the fact that if you're going to transport, and I actually believe and have a kind of a little different view, I think ammonia's inner nation or inner waterways, I think it's liquid hydrogen within countries. I think it's pipelines ultimately is the best solution. And a pipelines, you can transfer within a nation about three cents per every 160 kilometers. If you do that with gas, with trucks, it's about 80 cents. That's not going to work. And with liquid, it's about 18 cents. So you look at the numbers, you need pipelines. Uh, you also need storage, right? Because it doesn't always shine every day. The wind doesn't blow every day. And, you know, being in the right areas, I think is, uh, was brought up by Alex is really important. So when I look at a place like the United States to get there, where you really want to be is where the wind's always blowing in Wyoming. You want to leverage Williams natural gas pipelines that go and go into Chicago, go into Texas, go into California. Uh, and when it's not blowing, you want to have those natural caverns that you can store hydrogen. That's how, you know, just one example, how you can get the large capacities. And I agree with Patty. Um, you had a million tons of green hydrogen at the moment. You could sell that all day for any price. And, you know, so, I, um, so I'm not uh, religious about 100 million. I think I am religious about hydrogen is going to be a dominant energy source up to 20% of world's energy. I think that makes sense. And I think that path is coming. Thank you, Andy. So now I think we have definitely run out of time. <laughs> um, just uh, the uh, big remarks of the panel, probably. Um, I think it's an important point to change our mind, to change our society as well. Um, thinking about tons per day instead of tons per annum, I think that is uh, really, you know, uh, new for me. Um, things, uh, market is there. Um, and also the political uh, um, uh, policy, the, the, the public policies, I think it has to be really, really, really important. It's a key important thing to encourage, of course, the investment. So thank you very much for all of yours. And, and, and you all have a really nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.